Hi guys, some of you remember me. My name is Manik. My hair is growing back. Uh, today I'm with Lindy. Lindy is from A City Wildlife, and she has many talents, not the least of which is helping having saved hundreds of baby wombats, kangaroos, wallabies, and reintroducing them to lives that they wouldn't have known without her. Um, she has taught biology in schools. She uh, helps teach kids about biology and marsupials. And today, Lindy will be sharing with us her, her insights around the secret life of marsupials. So over to you, Lindy. Thanks very much for that. Um, so in my, in my real life, I have been a maths and science teacher. Um, I'm retired now. And I actually grew up in, in Arnhem Land where we, um, the, the Aboriginal men would go hunting and they, when they brought back a wallaby with a young joey in its pouch, we'd raise the joey and put it back into the bush. So I started looking after baby wildlife when I, many years ago when I was about 10, I suppose. Um, and then I, I came to ACT Wildlife 20-something years ago and started looking after all the different animals we have in the ACT. But over the last 10 years, I've fallen in love with wombats. So while this is technically about the secret life of marsupials, it'll be a lot about wombats. And if we look distracted throughout this uh, talk today, it's because there's actually a very lovely wombat who's wandering around the house at our feet. So um, I'll show her to you after. Um, could we have our next slide? Somebody's in charge of slides. <laughs> Is that what we're looking at now? Yeah. Okay. So um, do we want to go on to the next one? So some of the guest speakers you've had in the past have been uh, talking about the other areas of science, physics and chemistry and astronomy, um, I believe. I haven't been to any of those talks. Um, but this is, this is about biology, so the other arm of science. And we are the, biology is the study of living things. Uh, one of the interesting things about biology is it's often soft and squishy things. It's cute furry things. It involves, um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, it involves yucky things. Uh, we're going to be talking about things like peeing and pooing because those are really important things to do with being alive. And, and the, the thing about being alive is that it also includes things that uh, are born and grow and die. So biology is quite different from the other sciences. Um, so thank you for that. Now, like all scientists, biologists like to classify the living things. So where uh, chemists have classified elements according to characteristics they have in common with each other, Biologists do the same thing with living things. So we've, um, we're looking at, I, I'm having, this is very small for me. We're going to be looking at, in, in this classification slide, you can see, um, we're going to be looking at um, the animal kingdom. So first of all, the big classification is kingdoms. We're looking at the animal kingdom. So the next slide, thanks. And, and again, our, uh, our, our animal kingdom is divided Oh, that's not working either, hang on, uh, is divided into different uh, categories again. And so we're not going to worry about all these different types of categories. Uh, we're just going to uh, look at the classification of animals for a start. And animals are, are divided up into two broad categories again, and that's things with backbones and things that don't have backbones. And the wombats just climbed into a shelf. Um, that's the noise you can hear. <laughs> um, so we're looking at, um, you can see we've got uh, five different classifications there of vertebrates, and we're going to be looking at mammals. Uh, and um, Manik's going to go and rescue her because she's, she's tipped it all out. <laughs> you know, they say never work with kids and animals. This is why. So the great thing about mammals, and this is the thing I love so much about animals, um, is that they come in all shapes and sizes. They have such amazing variety of characteristics in the way they look, the way they behave. Um, oh, do you want to follow up on that one? So Mark Peachy said she can't get in. Um, and so uh, mammals are the, the, the ones that I'm going to be talking about today. In particular, oh no, we'll go back. So the things that um, if we move on to the next slide, thanks. The characteristic mammals have in common, there's a few. Um, mainly they give birth to live young. They feed their young milk. And that's, that's probably the characteristic that 
I'll be focusing on probably mostly, I'll refer back to from time to time throughout this, because it's the thing that sets, sets animals, uh, mammals apart from all other animals. They do something called thermoregulating, which is maintaining their own body temperature. So uh, we're mammals as humans, and if we go outside on a really cold day, um, and we don't have enough jumps on it, our body still stays warm on the inside because we have this ability to convert food that we take in for energy and convert that to warmth to keep all of our organs warm. So that's a characteristic of mammals. And that's even mammals that live in icy places can still keep their bodies warm. And they use a range of different mechanisms to do that. And the other thing that mammals have in common is that they all have hair. Now, some mammals have more hair than others. So if you think of something like lions and tigers, cats and dogs, they've got plenty of fur. Humans as mammals don't have so much. Ours tends to just be on our head. You might notice you've got a little um, bit of hair on your arms and legs, but we're not covered in fur the same as cats and dogs and other animals. And then if you think of things like uh, whales and dolphins, which are mammals, and you might not think they have hair, but in fact, they have um, a very tiny amount of hair, often little whiskers around their uh, faces, and their babies um, have hair when they're first born, very fine hair. So even mammals that you might not expect to have these characteristics do have them. Uh, can we have the next slide, thanks? So this is the key characteristic. So the one I said, where mammals feed their young milk, and this is what sets apart uh, mammals from other animals. Baby, uh, baby birds don't get fed milk. Lizards don't get fed milk. Frogs don't get fed milk, but our mammals do. And so some of you might even have had uh, a cat that's had kittens or a dog that's had puppies, or you've been to pick up a, a pet and you've seen it with its, with its mother. Um, if you've you've got your puppy as, uh, or a kitten as, as very tiny, you might have seen them with their mother. So we know that they drink their mum's milk. And in fact, humans are mammals. And one of the characteristics of humans is that we have the, uh, humans have the ability to feed their babies milk. But interestingly enough, uh, that's just the mums can do that. And then I said before about even uh, marine mammals like whales and dolphins that spend their entire lives in the water. They never come out of the water. They still feed their young milk, which is quite incredible. If you could imagine living in the ocean, which is salty water, and still having to drink milk every day while you're growing. Um, and that's what baby whales and dolphins do, which I find quite incredible. Um, and uh, there's some amazing videos you might find on YouTube of them doing it. Um, so it's just some interesting samples of the sorts of marine mammals that also feed their young milk. Uh, they do it in an interesting way, not that we're going to be talking about whales particularly, but uh, whales um, and dolphins, the baby doesn't suck the mother's milk, the mother squirts the milk out and the baby has to swim along right underneath her with its mouth open and catch the milk and manage uh, to drink the milk and, and not the seawater. So it's a pretty amazing process that marine mammals go through to get their milk. So throughout this, there's going to be some funny facts about being a, a mammal that drinks milk. So even though, <laughs> she's into everything down here, even though uh, male mammals have teats or nipples, I mean, they don't feed their babies, they still have teats or nipples, which is quite amazing. It's a completely redundant bit of apparatus on male mammals, um, most male mammals, not all. Um, we're gonna talk about different ones later. Um, so it's just an interesting characteristic. Uh, throughout this talk, I've got some funny facts and some yucky facts. That's what biology is about. So, sorry. Next slide. Yeah, sorry, I keep forgetting to say next slide. <laughs> um, so, when the, the animals we've been talking about so far cats, dogs, humans, lions, tigers, elephants they are this, the class of mammals called eutherians. Um, if you have a look on this little slide, then mammals have been divided up into two other classes. So, we've got marsupials, which I'm going to talk about now. Marsupials are really specialised mammals. Uh, so next slide. Um, they give birth to live young, mostly, but those young are incredibly undeveloped. They are born so tiny and so undeveloped um, that they can't possibly live at all outside of their mother's pouch. Um, and it's a, it's a characteristic that marsupials have developed over evolution. What it means is that because the baby finishes its growing outside the mother's body in a pouch, if the mother, mother's life becomes very stressed, so there may not be enough food, she may be being chased by a predator, 
she can, and I know this sounds terrible, she can put the baby out of its pouch and it will die, but she'll go on then to replace it with another one very soon. And she hasn't expended a lot of energy on that little baby. Um, and so in the scheme of keeping that species numbers good in, in that environment, she hasn't lo lost a lot. So as humans, we, we love our babies and we really value them and care for them. And, and we, we love our children and our families. Animals aren't quite that emotionally attached. They often are, but, but they, they tend not to be emotionally attached that way. So that's a survival characteristic for marsupials is that they can easily put out a very small undeveloped um, baby if they are under stress and then they just have to look at the mum just has to continue looking after herself until that stress is over. So the babies finish their development in their mum's pouch. Um, we've got quite a few species of, no, we have the majority of species of marsupials in the world. There are very few other countries that have marsupial mammals. We've got the ones everybody knows about. Koalas have had a huge amount of um, publicity over the recent bushfires. Uh, wombats got a lot less, and that was because uh, wombats went underground during the bushfires. Uh, and when they came out, unfortunately, their food was gone but they survived the fires because they were underground living animals, um, whereas kangaroos lived in trees and so they were affected badly by the fires. And then there's others you may not hear so much about quokkas and bilbies and, and, and a whole lot of other types. Can we go back a couple of slides, slides to the really cute, that's the one, the koala, thank you. So this is the one that we're all most familiar with. Um, really cute little babies, fluffy with big eyes. Um, looking very much like a little stuffed toy. Um, next one. Um, this little cutie is a swamp wallaby that I raised. Um, so again, they look incredibly cute as babies when they've got their fur, they, are, um, they, do, they just look like a lovely stuffed toy. Next one. But they don't start off life like that. So where your kittens and puppies are born with a lovely covering of fur and they just look like cute babies, You'll see the picture on the right there is a, a just born uh, Joey um, kangaroo, probably an Eastern Grey. And they're born about the size of a jelly bean. So they're really, really tiny. And the newborn baby climbs from the mother's birth canal a short distance up into her pouch. Now, the only thing, I think I've got some photos I'll show you in a minute, I think. Um, the only really thing, only thing they need to have well developed for that to happen is front legs, so they have usually have quite muscular forearms or front legs and they have a mouth well developed. And as soon as they've climbed up the mother's body and into the pouch, they attach to the mum's teat or the nipple and they start feeding. And, and obviously when they're tiny, they're just getting the tiniest little bit of milk at a time, but they finish their growing in there in that pouch. Um, and that's when they finish, their eyes finish forming, their limbs finish form, forming. And over quite a few months, they then develop into the, the cute little fluffy uh, animal like you see there in its mum's pouch. Um, so the next one, another funny fact. So while male dogs and cats and, and other mammals all have nipples or teats, and they, um, which are redundant because they don't have to feed uh, anything milk, um, male marsupials don't have any at all. So um, just one of those funny, funny things. Uh, we have an ACT wildlife uh, phone line so when people find an injured animal they can call us and we can look at taking it into care and helping it to recover um, but sometimes people pick up an animal and they can't tell if it's a marsupial or not so they, they want to know whether the the rat like animal they found is a marsupial or whether it's just a common rat which we don't care for and one of the first things we say is can they have a look at its belly if it's got a row of teats down the belly then it's not a marsupial so it's just an interesting uh, characteristics that marsupials have or don't have so if we go to the next slide this is um obviously a very undeveloped little animal um, and i don't know if we want people to be able to offer a guess as to what little animal that might grow into right so we have uh, a few guesses um including uh Wombat, wallaby, uh, a quokka, kangaroo, <laughs> um, a, a, a wok, a wok bat. A wok um, bat. That's a new one. Yes. <laughs> um, maybe a maybe a typo. A hippo, a <laughs> koala. I think everyone can see these these ones now. Um, Thank you. 
Okay, thanks for that. Um, and look, Ed, all of your guesses are equally valid because at this tiny stage, it's very difficult to tell which species this is going to be because they're born so undeveloped. And in fact, this one is a tiny, tiny baby wombat. And this one you can see um, has those very strong front limbs. You can see the big muscular shoulders there. This little one in particular, I think, was about six weeks after it was born. And unfortunately, it was too little for us to raise. We weren't able to raise that one, um, which was sad. Um, but we have to make decisions about what we can and can't do. But you can see the little eyes aren't formed yet. Um, so if we go on to the next stage and you'll see, um, you can see more of the, the, the way these little animals develop. So when human babies or, or dog and cat babies are born, they've pretty much got everything that they need for life. All their body parts are there, they're formed. Um, little marsupials aren't. So this little one that you're looking at on the slide now, you can see her beautiful, big, strong front arms. They're very muscular. Um, but if you have a look at her back legs, they're really scrawny. And that's because she didn't need her back legs when she was first born. And so they, didn't, they don't have to develop. And so they keep developing while she's in her mum's pouch um, until she gets much bigger. If we go on to the next slide, you can see her little eyes are still shut. She, they're still they're fused. They're actually, the eye is inside and it won't open up for several more weeks. And that's because, again, she doesn't need to be looking at anything. She's tucked inside her mum's pouch. And that little one is three and a half months old there. And I'll just see, I've got her here next to me now. Are we able to change this so I have the camera on me instead of the slides? Is that possible? And I'll scroll my So, if we So, this is that same little baby that we just had on a second ago. I don't know, can you see her there now? She's a bit cross at being woken up, and I've got cold hands as well. So can you see her? She's now uh, five and a half months old. Her eyes have opened. She's just starting to get fur. Um, and she's starting to stand up. She's trying to stand up. But she's still not ready to be born. If she was a, a kitten or a puppy, she's not ready to be born yet. She's still much too tiny. So she, she's living in a humidity crib. And she weighs half a kilo now, which is a lot more than when she was born. So I'll just put her back because she's getting cross at me. She's squeaking at me. Thank you for that. Sprung that on you. Are we back on the, we're back on this again? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we are. Thank you. Um, so you can see they develop really slowly and all of this is happening inside the mother's pouch. We don't get to see it normally. Um, the special thing about being a wildlife carer and a wildlife carer who looks after marsupials is we get to see this development happening in front of us. So that little girl I've been looking after for now for over two months, she was only 120 grams when I got her um, and uh, very, very undeveloped. She was on tiny, tiny amounts of milk, two mil of milk every three hours round the clock. She was living in, she still lives in a humidity crib where the temperature and the humidity are controlled for her. Um, she still has a little tiny bottle every four hours um, and it's a while before she'll be big enough to uh, do anything herself. The slide you're looking at now, we can see the little one who's got fur. That's uh, one I had last year. But you can see the development now, so the fur's starting to develop. And again, all this would happen inside the mother's pouch. We wouldn't see it at all. Um, it's pretty special. What she's going to grow into is something that looks more like what we know marsupial babies look like. Um, cute and fluffy and uh, very, very sweet. Um, I might actually just, can we do the camera again? Is that possible? And She's under the table now. <laughs> That's the monster. So this is this is the one that you're looking at on the screen. This is this is her now. She weighs about ten kilos. She's equivalent in development to maybe a preschool child. So she still has to have milk. She's on three bottles a day. She needs lots of cuddles, lots lots of attention. Um, she would still be with her mum, drinking her mum's milk if she still had her mum. 
So she's still just a, a baby or a toddler. She's just very naughty. She's trashed my, my lounge room while she's been here. She's pulled stuff out, she's spread it all over the floor, um, like a toddler does, exactly like a naughty toddler does. But she's very cute. So I'll just put her back down. Oh, right, thank you for that. <laughs> She's got her food there, she's just more interested in doing other things. Right. So I'll just I'll just go back a little bit, thank you. I'll go back a little bit and her story. So that, that little girl is Harriet. And so one of the things that's AC, ACT wildlife is that we we take in uh, wildlife that's been injured or orphaned um, in the ACT. And her story is that we think she was orphaned, so her mum was probably hit by a car while she was in her mum's pouch. And she's got out of her mum's pouch looking for her mum, probably, and a fox has taken her. So the rangers were actually out doing a night count of animals, which is one of their jobs. And in their, their torchlight, they saw the fox run by with something in its mouth. So they decided to go and see what it was, and they rescued her from the fox. Foxes aren't native in the ACT, they're not native in Australia. They're feral animals and they do terrible damage to our wildlife. So um, she very nearly became a fox's dinner. She was only about a kilo at the time. Um, they rescued her, but she was so badly hurt that we didn't think she'd live. She had terrible broken bones and infections. Um, and she spent two weeks living with a vet down in New South Wales while they treated the worst of her injuries. And then I had her for three months while we kept treating her injuries. And a lot of the time we didn't think she'd live because she was so sick. Anyway, you can see she's made a wonderful recovery and she's a beautiful girl. And in about another six or eight months, she'll be released back into the bush. Um, and she'll have wrecked your entire apartment. Right exactly, <laughs> exactly. So can we have the next slide? So this is a photograph um, of me at a recent release. That, that wombat we released weighed about 20 kilos. Um, I was struggling to hold him. He was such a big boy. And I'd had him since he was a tiny, tiny, tiny baby, a little unfurred joey. Um, so he went back into the bush again as a big, strong boy. So that's what we do. That's what ACT Wildlife does. Obviously, we do other species. We have birds and, and lizards and um, tortoises, uh, flying foxes, possums, wallabies. We do, we do all of them. But like I warned you at the beginning, wombats are my love. So now we go into some more yucky facts about marsupials in general. Next slide, thank you. Um, so, so I warned you we were gonna talk about poo. This is one of those times. Koala mums feed their little joeys in the pouch a special poo. So what the mum does, you can leave now if, you, if you're finding this too yucky. The mum poos out a very, um, very sloppy wet poo that she has specially for her joey. And it's, it's oh, can we have the next slide as well, thanks? It's called pap. And, and the joeys love it, apparently, and they, they might eat it for a day or they might eat it for a week or two weeks. And what that pap does is it gives a good bacteria in their stomach so they can digest eucalyptus leaves. Can we have the next slide, thanks? Eucalyptus leaves uh, have got toxins in them. So if other animals were to try to eat them, they would get quite sick from the toxins in the leaves. But, of course, those leaves are koalas only food so they have to be able to eat them and digest them and get nourishment out of them so this um, poo that the mum gives her baby sets up its gut so that it can digest those eucalyptus leaves uh, for the rest of its life um, now because we know so little about wombats in particular because wombats live underground can we have the next slide thanks um, we don't actually know um, whether wombat mums do the same for their baby. So their baby's living in the pouch um, and it's living in the pouch for about six or seven months after it's born or even more. Um, and it's got to be able to eat the grasses and things that the wombats mainly eat grass, dry grasses, roots, bark from trees. It has to be able to digest those foods. And we wonder whether wombat mums do the same. Now, not a lot's known. Wombats are nocturnal for the most part. They do come out in the day sometimes, but mostly they do their, their grazing at night time. And their babies live in pouches and they live underground. So there's so little opportunity to actually see what wombats are doing, whereas we see more of koalas and wallabies and kangaroos. So one of the things I've started to wonder, and this is, I guess, my science mind taking over, is whether wombat mums, can we have the next slide, thanks? do the same thing. So these are two little wombats that I've had come into care. 
Um, and you can see they've got dried poo on their faces. One of them, the hair's grown over the top of it, but the other one you can clearly see dried poo all over his face. And we get lots of little wombat babies that come in with caked on dried poo on their faces. So we're starting to ask the question now whether wombat mums do the same thing and provide their baby with a pre-digested poo that's got all the good bacteria in it that makes them able to digest grasses and roots and leaves and bark that they need to eat. So that's um, it's a question that I'm going to start asking other carers. I'm going to start collecting some uh, photographs of little animals with this on it and see whether we can get um, a, a few samples of this, this poo that they've got on their faces tested just to see what it's got in it, see whether it's different to uh, the more adult poo. I did warn you I was going to talk about poo, didn't I? Okay. So... Um, here's another funny fact. So when we looked at the photo of the kangaroo, the joey, out of her pouch, we can see the joey's sitting up at the top of the mother's body. Um, but um, a, a wombat's pouch opens up at the back. It opens up between the mum's back legs. And there's a very good reason for that. Oh, before we go on, hang on, next slide. We have to have the next slide first. And at this point, feel free to smile, laugh. Um, I love this. I just think it's, That's it's a funny such, <laughs> such a funny little photograph. Um, the mother kangaroo does a lot of work with her joey in there. So she pops her head inside. She grooms the joey right from when it's really tiny. She keeps her pouch clean. Uh, more yucky poo fact. She licks the baby when he poos and pees and to keep him clean. So she actually eats, the, eats whatever he puts out again. Um, and... So, so things like koalas and, and kangaroos and wallabies can all do that. Uh, next slide. But wombat mums have a backward opening cat pouch. Now you saw the wombat that I held up before. They actually have very short, short neck, very big solid shoulders right up to their, their chins. The wombat mum actually can't turn her head around or lean over and look inside her own pouch. It's not possible. So where the kangaroo mum can put her head in her pouch and see to her baby, a wombat mum can't do that. It's physically impossible. So the, the reason for the rear opening pouch is so that when she's digging her burrow, it doesn't fill up with dirt. That would be a bit um, unpleasant for the baby. So she has this backward opening pouch. And early settlers, well, the, the very first... Um, people who, who visited Australia from England uh, were most surprised by this when they saw this view of a mother wombat with a baby poking out between her back legs. And they actually thought they were witnessing a mother wombat giving birth while she was walking, uh, which would have been pretty amazing. They just didn't realise that this amazing marsupial life with a pouch, and not only that, but a pouch that opens towards the back. So that's what the, the mother wombat has. But what that means, and there's another gorgeous photo, the wombat babies stay in mum's pouch for a long time. They're really big babies when they finally get out and do all their walking themselves. So she's actually, her pouch is dragging along on the ground with that great big baby in it. And they'll stay in the pouch until maybe three or four kilos or more. So they're quite big when they leave the pouch. Um, but because of that, so the next slide, thanks. Because of that, baby wombats actually have to look after themselves while they're growing inside their mum's pouch. She can't get in and lick them clean. She can't get in and check that they're okay. She can't do any of that. So we don't know much about how baby wombats stay clean and healthy in the pouch. Now, the other thing is that wombats don't use their tongue for grooming. So if you've watched your cat or dog, it will lick its fur to keep it clean. Um, and kangaroos and wallabies do the same thing. They lick their, lick their hands and then use that to brush their fur down. But wombats don't use their tongues for licking. In fact, I, I'd had probably three or four wombats before I realised they could even put their tongue out of their mouth because they just don't use their tongues for anything other than eating. Um, so the mother wombats don't groom their babies. They don't lick their little bottoms when they pee and poo. So we don't really know how baby wombats look after themselves in their pouch. Um, so it's one of those real mysteries. And as wombat carers, when we're looking after them, we just have to try to do the best we can um, when we're looking after them. So next one. Okay. More poo stuff. So how are we going for time? Are we good? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, that's good. That's about what I've got. So there's this, I'm not going to call it an urban myth, but people always say, yes, wombat poo is square. It's not 
really square and I've got some lovely photos for you in a minute but it's the shape of wombat poo next slide thank you is because wombats take so long to digest their food they eat really poor quality grasses um, so they can eat dry grass poor quality grass they can dig up roots and eat those they eat the bark from trees um, and that's got very little nutrition in it and so what happens is is the wombat takes days and days and days to digest that food six up, up to six days so something at eight now won't have worked its way all through its digestive system for another five or six days and in that time it extracts every bit of nutrition out of that food that it possibly can now um if people you think right I'm, I, this i warned you about this if you had corn for dinner last night i'm pretty sure you'll be pooping out corn today our gut works really quickly. Human guts um, digest food within a few hours. So anything you ate last night will come out the next day. Uh, wombats take much longer than that. Now, funnily enough, um, I've had some baby wombats that went six weeks without a poo. Um, did worry me a little bit the first time it happened and I kept taking the baby to the vet to have its tummy checked and an ultrasound and it was fine. It was just using every tiny bit of nutrition in the milk that it was having. Um, and it didn't, it didn't have any waste to put out. And finally, after six weeks, six weeks, it just started pooing. So wombat poo. So because it takes so long for food to pass through a wombat's digestive tract, it tends to just get compacted up a bit and a little bit squared off on the edges. Now, as it turns out, wombats like to do, leave their poo on a high place, so they'll climb up onto a rock and, and do it there, and it stops it from falling off. And they use that poo as a like a business card and it tells anybody who goes past that that wombat has been there it has its smell and it's like its business card so other wombats know that that particular rock on that bit of territory belongs to that wombat next slide any guesses about what this little baby might be so we've got a few guesses coming in <laughs> I can see, so yes, you all know. <laughs> so, um, echidnas are a really special type of mammal marsupial uh, called a monotreme. These are egg-laying marsupials. Uh, so, instead of giving birth to a tiny, undeveloped, live young, they actually lay an egg. Um, and they keep that egg tucked in a fold in their belly. They don't have a proper pouch until the egg hatches. And um, then once the egg's hatched, um, echidnas leave their little tiny babies. They're called puggles, not joeys. They leave them in a burrow and um, come back and see to them um, on a regular basis. So uh, this is, you can see why the mother does not keep a baby echidna uh, in a pouch because of all those spikes. Um, so we have the next slide and I'm sort of going a little bit faster now. So the other monotremes, um, yes, um, that we, we have are platypus. And again, early visitors to Australia thought that the platypus, uh, in fact, a, a platypus skeleton was a, a body, a dried body was sent to a scientist in England. And um, he thought it was a practical joke because he thought it was a, a combination of two or more animals uh, stuck together because of its amazing uh, anatomy. Um, but mon uh, um, platypus and echid echidnas are our two monotremes. So monotremes have this amazing thing where they can lay eggs. Uh, and <laughs> um, Manik's trying to drag the wombat out from behind the, the um, cage in here. Uh, and so the thing about echidnas is that once their babies are in a burrow, they only have to go back and feed them every five days. So these little animals have got such a slow metabolic rate, they need very little food. Um, the mother gives them really good quality milk and they, um, they only go back every few days to feed them. The sad thing about that though, is if an echidna gets hit by a car um, and it's a female echidna, we never know where to find the babies because they'll be in a burrow somewhere. And so as well as losing the mum to, the, to a road accident, we lose the babies because we can't, we don't know where they are. Um, so strange fact now about echidnas, we're nearly done now. Um, that they only feed their babies every few days. And the other thing is that, um, oh, we'll come back to that. That's the other monotremes, our little platypus. These ones are baby platypus on the next slide. Extremely cute babies, those ones are. Um, and then on the next slide, so 
So our echidnas and platypus, they don't even have teats to feed their babies milk. I warned you that this would be a scene throughout when we talk about mammals. Um, and the babies just have to lick the milk from the mum's skin. So the, the milk just seeps out of the mum's skin through special little pores and they lick the milk off her skin. So that's an even more amazing feature that they have. And I just wanted to finish up with this. Wombats have characteristics, some of them, I have no idea what the purpose of them is. They have this ridiculous little tail that you can see there. Um, no idea what that tail does, they can't wag it. They can't do anything with it, it just is there. And the other thing they've got there you can see is those two tiny little thumbs on their back feet. They can't do anything with those either. Those thumbs don't have any joints. They're not able to move them. They don't have any claws on them. Um, not quite sure what, what purpose they have. So they're obviously a remnant from their development. Um, and, and I just love them. <laughs> so that was, that's as far as I've got to go. Um, if people have questions. Awesome. Great. Thank you for that, Wendy. And this, for those who don't who can't see it, there is demolition of Lindy's house happening here as we speak. 